Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. In 1945, as World War II was grinding to its close, a man named Edgar Casey died. He was famous throughout the land for the thousands of psychic readings he had given in hypnotic trances. People referred to him as the Sleeping Prophet. His influence on alternative medicine was so great that he's been referred to as the father of holistic medicine. He's also considered one of the fathers of the New Age movement. The extensive transcripts of his psychic readings make him the most documented psychic of the 20th century, and he's arguably the most famous psychic of the 20th century, with hundreds of books having been written about him. Who was Edgar Cayce? What did his psychic readings say, and what should we make of them? What theories about Edgar Cayce will we be looking at? As always, we're going to look at this mystery from both the perspectives of faith and reason. From the reason perspective, we need to consider whether there is a natural or a paranormal explanation for all this. Uh, could Casey's readings have been the product of his imagination? Could he have been a hoaxer? Could he have been a genuine psychic? Could the explanation be more complex than that? What does the evidence say? And what should we make of Casey's claims from the faith perspective? You're listening to episode 225 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Edgar Casey's psychic abilities and what to make of them. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Last time, we talked about psychic Edgar Casey and his remarkable story. Casey passed into the great beyond in 1945 but he left behind a legacy that's fascinated people ever since. So what startling claims did he make in his readings? Did Edgar Casey have genuine psychic abilities? And what does the evidence say? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, this is a part two of a patron choice episode, right? Yes, uh, uh, patron Paul Leone uh, asked to hear about Edgar Casey, and so he's getting an extra episode for his his uh, request. Uh, last time we talked about Edgar Casey's life. This time we're doing analysis. Excellent. All right, so we're in the reason perspective. What can we say about Edgar Casey from the reason perspective? Let let's start with a basic question. There are many different reported psychic abilities, like precognition, telepathy, psychokinesis. Which abilities was Casey reported to have? He doesn't fit neatly into any one category, but the thing that he most closely resembles is a specific form of remote viewing known as ERV, or extended remote viewing. We talked about ERV in episode 190, which was part one of our interview with Major Bill Ray, who practiced extended remote viewing while he was in the Defense Department Stargate program in the 1980s. You can go back and listen to that for more information about ERV as it's done today. But basically, in ERV, the viewer lies down and relaxes and tries to almost but not quite fall asleep. It's described as a mind awake, body asleep state. So you're mentally aware, but your body is very, very relaxed. And in that state, the viewer tries to receive psychic impressions of the target, uh, whatever it happens to be for that session. And there is someone sitting by who asks questions and directs the session and takes notes. Um, someone else, all, either that person or someone else, transcribes or records what the viewer says so that there will be a record of the psychic impressions he obtained. And how does that compare with what Casey did? Outwardly, it's very similar. Uh, Casey would lie down, relax, and try to start accessing information psychically. There would be a person, often his wife Gertrude, giving him directions about what kind of information he was supposed to retrieve. And since this was early enough that home sound recording wasn't available or wasn't great, um, there would be a secretary whose name was Gladys Davis that would transcribe everything he was saying. Later, she would type it up and send a transcript to the person who had commissioned the reading. There were various similarities in this to modern remote viewing. One was that he did not need for the person to be present in order for him to give a reading. 
Instead, they would tell him where the person is currently located, which was something they'd arrange before they did the reading. For example, you know, they'd write or telephone the person and say, we'll be doing your reading on this day at this time. Where will you be? And then they'd give that information to Casey. A typical direction might be. You will have before you the body of Vera Smith, who is at 2405 West 7th Street, Dayton, Ohio. In fact, that's the actual information he was given during a reading on February 12th, 1934. Only in this case, the reading didn't happen because Edgar was too relaxed and actually did fall asleep. So they had to write Miss Smith back and say, we have to reschedule. Where will you be at 10 a.m. on February 25th? Also, in this case, his wife gave him the information five times, but he didn't acquire the target before he fell asleep. Uh, A lot of that is a lot like extended remote viewing. Uh, What he was doing was essentially a form of coordinate-based viewing where the target is indicated by a geographical location. In this case, they were using a street address. In the 1980s, they often would use geographical coordinates, you know, longitude and latitude, but they later abandoned that. But this is basically the same thing. Uh, And Edgar would then start getting impressions of the target he had been directed to. In some cases, he would report back that the person wasn't at the target location, for example, if they were still on their way there. In their book, The Outer Limits of Edgar Cayce's Power, his sons Hugh Lynn and Edgar Evans write, Many readings illustrate the fact that Cayce's subconscious mind seemed able to move from wherever he lay on a couch to the location of the individual for whom he was giving the reading. The readings abound with such opening remarks as, what a pretty rooster in the yard, or there's been an auto accident in the street, or he's not here now, he will be here in a few minutes. Yes, we have the body here. He has just laid aside his paper he was reading. Is this body in bed? No, she is sitting in a large chair talking to a man. Yes, we have the body here. We have had this client before. She hasn't dressed yet, you see. All of this is very much like extended remote viewing with sensory descriptions of the target site. Besides the location, how much information was he given about the target? Usually not very much. Uh, In remote viewing, knowing about the target in advance is called front loading. And as we've discussed in previous episodes, Remote viewers often do not want to be front loaded because it makes their imaginations active and that could interfere with the psychic impressions they're trying to pick up. So unlike many psychics, a lot of remote viewers want to know as little as about the target as possible. I haven't run across references to Casey wanting to avoid front loading for that reason, but he often was given very little information. In addition to the location of the target, he would typically know the name of the person he was supposed to be doing the reading for, and from that he could infer the person's sex and maybe approximately how old they were uh, if it was a name tied to a particular decade and maybe their ethnicity if it was an ethnically distinct name. Other than that, he would be told what they wanted to know about. Uh, In most of his readings, they wanted help with a health problem, but he often was not told what the health problem was. For example, in the case of Miss Smith's reading, here is what Gladys told him. Now you will have before you the body of Vera Smith, who is at 2405 West 7th Street, Dayton, Ohio. You will go over this body carefully, examine it thoroughly, and tell me the conditions you find at the present time, giving the cause of the existing conditions, also the suggestions for the help and relief of this body. You will speak distinctly at a normal rate of speech. You will answer the questions that may be asked. So even though Miss Smith was asking him for help with a health problem, he wasn't front-loaded beyond that about what the problem might be. In fact, Miss Smith herself wasn't sure. Uh, her, in her initial letter, she just said, I've been sick for some time. The doctors seem to disagree on what is wrong. Will you please give me a reading? From that, Edgar was expected to identify what the condition was, uh, what was causing it, and what they could do to treat it. So the amount of front-loading was small. There was a little bit, but it's not like he was told what symptoms the person was suffering or what doctors had diagnosed. The minimization of front-loading is similar to modern remote viewing, but what about all the medical stuff? 
Do modern remote viewers typically diagnose medical conditions and how they can be treated? Not typically, no. Uh, there are some medical applications for remote viewing, but a typical remote viewer today generally is not expected to discern symptoms, identify their cause, and recommend a course of treatment, especially not uh, the highly specific courses of treatment that Casey provided, which often included detailed instructions about how to make and mix the exact combinations of ingredients for the cure, as well as dosage information and how to apply it. That's very different than what m remote viewing today typically involves. And that's one of the reasons that Casey doesn't fit neatly into one of the conventional psychic categories we use today. What are some of the other differences? For a start, um, he said that he did not remember what was happening when he was doing a reading. And while a person doing ERV might forget some details of his experience, just like, you know, a waking person may not remember every single little thing they were doing in the last few minutes, ERVers don't get amnesia during a session. Um, that's, that's kind of a 19th century trope where psychics would report losing consciousness during their trances and so forth. Also, uh, Casey delivered his results in a form of rather stilted narrative speech. Um, for example, he would usually announce that he had acquired the target by saying, we have the body, meaning that he was remotely viewing the client. Then he would describe what was wrong with them and how it could be fixed in the form of a kind of oral essay. After that, he would answer questions, uh, again, typically using a short essay style of response. And that's quite different than the results in extended remote viewing, where the replies are much more conversational. For example, if an ERVer is asked to describe a building, he might say, uh, it looks three stories tall rather than delivering a little mini essay about it. Why did Casey speak in this formal way, delivering mini essays and referring to himself as we? It's widely thought that his subconscious composed the formal narration uh, that he spoke in, knitting together, you know, the little mini essays from perceptions he was having. Presumably, he believed either consciously or subconsciously that the results would have more impact if they, would de if they were delivered that way rather than, than conversationally. And the we was apparently part of this formal style of speaking. Um, that kind of use of the plural is done in a lot of languages. It's known as gnosism from the, or gnosism from the Latin word nos, which means we or us. Uh, we're most familiar with it in English as the majestic we, which conveys a sense of authority. Sometimes it's called the royal we because monarchs use it. Uh, but it's actually used by authoritative figures who aren't monarchs, including, for example, university rectors. There are other forms of Gnosticism in English, but his Casey's We Have the Body style of narration was apparently to provide a sense of formality and authoritativeness for the information he was delivering. And that information is the biggest difference between what Casey was doing and typical extended remote viewing. In modern remote viewing of all kinds, there are certain types of information that are supposed to be easier to get than others, and Casey's was very different. Like what? What kinds of information would be easier and which would be harder? Concrete sensory impressions, like what the target looks like or what sounds are present at a location, are considered easy to get or as easy as anything is in the psychic world. But abstract things like words, names, and numbers are considered harder, much harder. Um, with Casey, it didn't matter. You could apparently ask him anything and he would reply. For example, here's a clip of parapsychologist Stephen Schwartz speaking on Jeffrey Mishlove's New Thinking Aloud program. Stephen Schwartz is a parapsychologist who has personally read all 14,000 readings, so he's an expert on Edgar Casey. And here he describes an incident where they were trying to locate a hard-to-find ingredient needed for one of the treatments Casey recommended. And Casey retrieved specific concrete information about its location. 
There were these kinds of cases. There were stories where he would say, uh, go to this drugstore and on the third shelf, in the back of the shelf, you'll find this bottle and it's got this particular label. And they would notify the pharmacist and he would say, or he said, I don't have anything like that. And they said, well, go back and look. Mm -hmm. And so he came, and then he came back in, on the phone and, and said, well, I, 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 I don't know where this came from, but that was exactly right. There's this bottle. <laughs> <laughs> smoke oil that's um, at the, at the company doesn't exist anymore and it got it must have been back there for years but it mm -hmm. was exactly where he said it was mm -hmm. he also reportedly had no difficulty in psychically retrieving abstract things like words there are even reports of him being able to give readings in languages that he didn't consciously know for example he reportedly gave a reading for a woman from the region of Genoa, Italy, and gave the reading in the Genovese dialect. Uh, and there's thousands of these examples. And so I had read all these things and I had seen the documentation that they were correct. So here's a man who's who's sitting uh, either in Hopkinsville, Kentucky or in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and he's talking about people. And in some cases, for instance, in one particular case that I remember, he gave a reading in a dialect of Italian. And he didn't speak Italian. He had an eighth grade education, post-Civil mm -hmm. War, uh, rural Southern education. And he's giving this reading in a di not just Italian, but a dialect of Italian. And they couldn't understand it. And they had to go out. And, and Hugh Lynn went out and found a fruit vendor who came from, it was Genovese, I think, mm -hmm. and who could, in, who could translate it. It was for a woman in Italy. Oh. And he gave it, he gave the reading in the dialect of her region. If Casey was able to get information that goes beyond what remote viewers today are typically able to get, what was the source of his information? In their book, The Outer Limits of Edgar Casey's Power, his sons synthesized the data that they had, including a lot of things Casey said in the readings about where the information was coming from, and they identify several sources. First, they mention unconscious memory. That is, things that Casey knew, even though he wasn't consciously aware of knowing them. Skeptics often propose unconscious memory or cryptomnesia as a possible way that people could have knowledge of things that they aren't consciously aware of. And Casey's sons are forthright in saying that this may have been part of what was happening with their father. For example, they say that in cases where one of the clients happened to be present for the reading, he may have subconsciously picked up on clues about their health by observing them, and then this came out in the readings. As we'll uh, see later, Casey may have had background information, like information about osteopathic med medical treatments or spiritualist concepts in his memory that also came out in the readings. So some of the content of the readings could have been purely natural. What about cases where such natural explanations wouldn't apply, like when a client wasn't present? And he was still able to get information about the target. The second source that the son's name is clairvoyant observation of physical data. They write, Many readings illustrate the fact that Casey's subconscious mind seemed able to move from wherever he lay on a couch to the location of the individual for whom he was giving the reading. So this would be essentially the same thing as modern remote viewing. The third source that they give is telepathic communication between Edgar Cayce's subconscious or superconscious mind and that of other individuals, living or dead. And this is what they thought was responsible for a lot of the information that came back in the health readings. The idea is that Cayce's subconscious made telepathic contact with the subconscious of the client. Deep down, the client had a subconscious understanding of what was going on in their body and what was responsible for the medical condition that they were experiencing. By tapping this information, Casey was able to describe and diagnose the problem as well as, as get leads for what might make it better. The sons write that in the process of giving health readings, childhood accidents and illnesses of the client were recalled. Mental and emotional problems were bared as well as physical ailments. With few exceptions, the patients who followed Casey's suggested treatments got results, often remarkable cures. This type of diagnosis by Edgar Casey suggests a strong rapport between the psychic and the patient and indicates to us a telepathic communication between minds 
at an unconscious level. We believe many of the physical readings, approximately 60% of Edgar Cayce's work, comes from this source, telepathic communication between psychic and patient at an unconscious level. So a good bit of the Casey material could be explained by using remote viewing to contact the target and then telepathy to diagnose the problem. And that's actually similar to what is reported in ERV, though usually not with medical diagnosis being the thing studied. Um, ERVers report being able to ask questions of the people at target sites and get answers. Usually, the person at the target site isn't aware of this, so presumably the telepathic contact with them would be subconscious. Back in episode 190, we heard Major Ray talk about how he used this technique to find a particular place in the Kremlin that he needed to go to while remote viewing the site. And he went to the Kremlin initially, didn't know how to get to this particular location, and so he mentally asked someone there for directions uh, you know, to the specific location where he needed to go. Casey's sons also suggested that he could contact the minds of individuals who were no longer living. Yes, the reading said that he could do this as long as the person's spirit had not yet passed to another plane of existence. But he didn't do this the way that mediums do, where you call up a spirit and interrogate it or let it speak through you. The sons write, There were numerous references to communication with entities who had passed on but in no instance did he indicate a specific guide or control spirit for any reading. Rather, he described it as a movement of his own higher consciousness to contact the minds of entities on the earth plane and other planes of consciousness. He repeated what he saw, heard, and felt. For example, we at no time had a change of voice or personality. Frequently, it was as if he had interviewed an individual or simply had gone to a particular individual or place and picked up impressions. And the Suttons acknowledged that when this happened, the departed spirits might be uncooperative or even untrustworthy. For example, in 1951, six years after Casey's death, his sons were trying to locate some buried artifacts whose location Casey had described while he was alive. They were having trouble doing so, and Hugh Lynn wrote, We must also consider the possibility that personalities on another plane of consciousness either do not desire that the cash be located or are simply having fun at our expense. So just because you're talking to someone uh, psychically doesn't mean they'll help you or that you can trust them. Important to remember. Some listeners may have read that Casey tapped the Akashic record in his readings. What is that? It's supposed to be a record of what people have done in the world. The idea is that when people make choices and perform actions, it has an effect that leaves psychic traces. The exact medium on which these traces are supposed to be recorded is not known. However, in the 19th century, some authors started referring to them as being written on the Akasha. Akasha is the Sanskrit word for sky. It's also translated ether. And 19th century science thought that space was filled with a physical substance called ether. This physical ether was held to be responsible for how light waves can propagate through otherwise empty space and, you know, the way sound waves can propagate through air. 20th century science abandoned the concept of a physical ether, but the idea seems to be that there might be a psychic equivalent of ether and people's choices and actions have an impact on this psychic ether leaving a record. And some named the psychic ether with the Sanskrit word Akasha, and so that would give us the Akashic record. That's just one way of conceptualizing it, though. The basic idea was that if Casey could contact an individual's subconscious, he could pull information from some kind of psychic record of events. So in addition to natural sources of information like unconscious memory, Casey was thought to be able to pull information psychically from several sources. These included what we would now call remote viewing, as well as telepathic contact with people living or dead, and a psychic record of events. His subconscious then synthesized this information and presented it in the little mini-essays in the readings. If those were supposed to be his sources, let's start examining the readings critically. Could they have just been the product of his imagination? 
It's always possible that information that a psychic reports could be due to innocent imagination. The question then becomes whether the information that they report has an accuracy rate that goes beyond what you would expect by random chance if they were guessing. In Casey's case, you could propose imagination for much of what he said, at least before looking at his accuracy rate. But this explanation won't work for everything. For example, it won't work for the readings he reportedly gave in Italian. I mean, a few words of Italian could be chalked up to cryptomnesia, but not composing whole grammatically correct sentences that are on topic and go on statement after statement. To compose in Italian that way due to natural causes, you'd have to know Italian. And to do that, you'd have to have learned at some point And learning a language is hard work. If Casey had learned Italian, he would have remembered it and would not have innocently imagined a reading or even a good chunk of a reading in Italian. He could have been faking, but it wouldn't have been innocent imagination one way or the other. So could he have been a conscious fraud then? Could the Italian reading in the archives be a fake? I don't have specific evidence on that, but it's a possibility that has to be considered. However, most people who have looked into Casey have concluded that he was sincere and not a conscious fraud. For example, Stefan Schwartz reports on when he first went to the ARE, the Association for Research and Enlightenment, in Virginia Beach to do his complete read-through of all the Casey readings. In those days, the ARE was a little tiny organization of about 1,800 people. Mm -hmm. And and the people that were at Virginia Beach at the old hospital were mostly elderly people who had known Edgar Cayce when he had been alive. He died in 1946. Mm -hmm. So Gladys Davis Turner, uh, Gladys Davis, as she's usually known, who was Edgar Cayce's lifelong secretary and who continued the work after he died. Mm -hmm. And Hugh Lynn Casey, uh, his eldest son, uh, I got to be very friendly with both of them. And I interviewed all of these people who had known him and who said, no, no, he was completely legit. I mean, this was not this was not some kind of scam. And so I I don't believe anyone has ever questioned his sincerity. That's a bit of an exaggeration. There have been people who questioned his sincerity. For example, super skeptic James Randi did. But. Then Brandy had an extreme bias and would accuse basically anyone of being a hoaxer, even when he didn't have evidence. What does the evidence say in Casey's case? Edgar Casey is the best documented psychic of all time, meaning we have more documentation about his activities than anyone else. And that's because of all the records that Gladys Davis kept, including not only the transcripts of the readings, but all the correspondence as well, meaning the requests that came in for readings, the follow-up letters that were sent, and what people wrote back to Casey after the readings. There are tens of thousands of pages of this material, and it's still kept at the ARE archives, and it's publicly available. As a result, we have an enormous amount of information available for tracking what Casey knew and when, and that material appears to reliably describe what happened. If you were conducting a fraud, you wouldn't bother to do all the elaborate record keeping and indexing, not to mention a mountain of material like that. And if you were engaged in systematic document fabrication uh, with that much material, you'd eventually screw up and leave traces that would later be discovered. But people have not found any kind of fraud in the archives, so it appears to be an accurate record that we can use to assess whether Casey had anything going on beyond chance. Then let's look at the evidence we have and what it says about whether Casey could perform better than chance. What about the portion of his readings that could be explained by ordinary remote viewing? I'm not aware of a statistical study that's been done of this, but anecdotally, it does appear that he could do better than random chance at, at describing target sites. Like in the example we heard where he they were trying to locate a hard to find ingredient and Casey was able to describe what shelf the pharmacist had it on, even though the pharmacist didn't know it was there. There are a number of examples where Casey produced surprising information about a site, and it's said later to have been verified. What about the accuracy rate of the medical readings that were the majority of his work? 
Here, there have been attempts to evaluate their accuracy. In Edgar Casey in Context, K. Paul Johnson writes, Five years after Casey's death, journalist Sherwood Eddy conducted a survey of 11 doctors who had cooperated with the readings. Two had handled too few cases to participate, but the remaining nine gave answers that were consistently favorable about the accuracy of diagnosis and the efficacy of treatments prescribed. A doctor in Bronxville, New York, evaluated Casey's diagnoses as 100% correct in the 12 cases he had treated. After treating more than 20 persons who had received readings, a Detroit physician estimated the accuracy of diagnosis at 80 to 90%. A Washington physician who had seen five patients with Casey readings gave an 80% accuracy rating to the diagnoses. In Albany, New York, a cooperating physician stated that all five patients he had seen had received correct diagnoses. Of nine cases seen by a Port Washington, New York doctor, the medical readings were correct in diagnoses for all but one. A New York physician who had treated 100 patients with readings by Casey estimated the accuracy of diagnoses as 80%. Another gave no statistical estimates, but said that Casey's diagnoses were, quote, very good. The closest to a dissenting voice was from a Norfolk, Virginia doctor who said that Casey's diagnoses could not be considered scientific, but still gave evidence of, quote, extraordinary powers. The consensus among, among respondents was that Casey's diagnostic accuracy compared favorably to that of other physicians, but was by no means perfect. The efficacy of his treatments was rated just as favorably as the diagnoses. So those are favorable results, but we have to keep them in context. Uh, this was just one survey and it had a small sample size, just nine physicians. And we don't know what kind of physicians they were. If they were willing to work with Casey's treatments, they may have been practitioners of alternative medicine rather than mainstream doctors. And there may easily have been self-selection bias here. Uh, that is, the doctors most impressed with Casey may have responded to the survey, while those who weren't as impressed might not have. So it's a survey with quite positive results, but it's of limited value. Has there been an attempt to judge the quality of the medical readings based on what's in the archives? In The Outer Limits of Edgar Casey's Power, uh, his sons do a statistical survey of a random sample of 150 of his readings, and it was random. Uh, they used a random number generator in the form of drawing numbered slips of paper out of an envelope to determine which readings would be included in the sample. They then looked in the archives to see what follow-up reports that they had on these readings, such as whether the client got better or not, if they followed Casey's recommended treatment. Of the 150 readings, they did not have follow-up reports for 74 of them, or approximately 50%. They had 11 negative reports, meaning that the client didn't think they got better. And they had 65 positive reports, meaning that the client did think they got better. The question is how you evaluate those numbers, given the fact that they didn't have follow-up reports for half of the cases. If you compare the 11 negative and 65 positive reports against the 76 cases where they did have follow-up reports, then the negative reports make up about 14.5% of the total, and the positive reports make up about 85.5% of the total. Uh, this is the basis of the statistic that you sometimes hear that Edgar Casey's readings were 85% accurate. And that would be broadly consistent with the results of the survey that Sherwood Eddy did after Edgar Casey's death of physicians who worked with his clients. But it could be that the people who sent in follow-up reports were mostly those who thought they'd been helped, and so the ones who didn't respond might have been much more negative. Well, they might have. Uh, if we were to assume that all 74 non-responders would have sent uh, in negative reports, then that would reduce the 85% positive ratio to just 43%. Uh, but that's a worst-case scenario. A best-case scenario would be if all the non-responders were positive, and that would raise the positive rate to 93%. On the other hand, if you assume that the non-responders were split 50-50 between positive and negative, uh, then the positive rating would be 68%. So 
I'm not sure what the correct estimate should be here. It's somewhere between 43% on the low end and 93% on the high end. And somewhere in the range between 68 and 85% wouldn't be unreasonable. How does that compare to just random chance? It's harder to judge. Uh, it would depend on the particular illnesses that people had and what treatments were available. I don't have data at hand, and I don't have time to do the analysis for this episode, but two additional factors need to be borne in mind. First, lots of conditions get better on their own as the body heals itself over time. So even if Casey's recommended treatment had no effect, the client might still think it did just due to natural healing and send in a positive report. Second, the placebo effect is real, and the fact that any treatment is given can make patients feel better, which would again lead to positive reports. So we need to include both the body's natural healing ability and the placebo effect in figuring out what random chance results should be. What is your overall assessment of whether Casey's health readings had anything beyond random chance involved? It's hard to say, uh, but if the positive rating should be judged as being between 68 and 85 percent, which are mid-range values being neither worst nor best case scenarios, then that's significant. Uh, as a result, I'm not convinced by the evidence I've seen, but I don't rule out that something paranormal was happening here. All right, before we move on to the rest of our analysis, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Daniel Z. Robert B., Don T., Lisa M., and Aaron W. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fearvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by delivercontacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit delivercontacts.com. Jimmy, let's turn to another set of things Casey discusses in his readings, which is the history of the world. What can you tell us here? Casey made a lot of claims about the history of the world, and in particular, the early history of mankind. He often did this in his past life readings, which we'll talk about later. But overall, he constructed a narrative that has been very influential. Some of the claims he made have been made by others in the esoteric community, particularly among theosophists and the like. But he also introduced new claims that are still popular today. Basically, he said that before humanity, there were a variety of strange creatures living on Earth, including satyrs, mermaids, and unicorns. Then our bodies evolved to the point that they could be suitable vehicles for the human soul. And then, at a certain point in time, the human race became ensouled. Not, though, in a single place like Africa, but in multiple places at once, giving rise to the different human races. And where were these locations? They were in the Gobi region of East Asia, in India, in Carpathia, in the Andes Mountains, in the Western Plains of North America, and on the lost continent of Atlantis, which was not an island, but a continent the size of Europe. Atlantis also wasn't the only lost continent held to exist, but it was the one he focused on the most. He portrays Atlantis as developing a psychically and technologically advanced civilization with a bunch of technologies we either haven't invented yet or only recently began making. For example, uh, he says that the Atlanteans had an electrical knife that would let them do bloodless surgery. And that sounds a bit like modern laser surgery, where an electrically powered laser is used as a knife that cauterizes blood vessels as it makes incisions. And eventually, Atlantis was destroyed in successive stages, with the final sinking around 10,000 BC or 12,000 years ago. And did all of the Atlanteans die when that happened? No, as the continent broke up and then began sinking in stages, many Atlanteans escaped, 
According to the readings, the refugees went to various places in the world and contributed to civilizations we know to have lived there, um, such as the Incan Empire in South America, various places in Central America, such as the Yucatan, and they contributed to the mound builder civilization here in North America. He also said that some settled in Morocco, in North Africa, in the Pyrenees Mountains between uh, modern Spain and France, and especially in Egypt. Edgar Casey had a lot to say about Egypt. What were some of the claims he made? Basically, he said there was a developed civilization there before 10,000 BC, and that this was the period when the pyramids and the Sphinx were built. Those are both claims that have gone on to be popular in some circles. Um, Casey said that the Great Pyramid was designed by a priest named Ra Ta, and that below the right paw of the Sphinx, there is a chamber known as the Hall of Records, which contains evidence of Atlantis. The idea of a Hall of Records below the Sphinx also has been very popular in so-called alternative Egyptology. How well do Casey's claims about world history stand up from the reason perspective? Not well. Uh, We'll talk about Atlantis in future episodes, but for now, suffice it to say that Casey's narrative of of a continent the size of Europe at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean is not supported by the geological evidence. Uh, We now have maps of the seafloors around the world, and there is no sunken continent in the North Atlantic. What is down there is a structure known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is the boundary between the North American continental plate on its western side and the Eurasian and African continental plates on its eastern side. But The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is not a sunken continent. In fact, it's sort of the opposite. Since the continental plates are pulling apart, magma from inside the Earth pushes up, and when it emerges into the seawater as lava, it hardens and builds up the ridge. So rather than being something that sank from above, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is simply being formed by inner Earth forces pushing upward as the plates spread. Didn't Casey predict that parts of Atlantis would start to reemerge in the 1960s? He did, which is one of the reasons the theory of Atlantis was popular in the 1960s. People got really excited in 1968 when an underwater structure known as the Bimini Road was discovered by some divers. It's located near North Bimini Island in the Bahamas near Florida and Cuba. People thought it might be a road made by the Atlanteans, and in the early 1970s, right after the structure was discovered, there were a number of articles claiming it was a man-made structure. However, it's been studied by geologists and archaeologists, and it's been concluded that it's a natural formation. It's, It's made of beach rock, meaning sedimentary rock made from a beach that has cracked in such a way that it superficially looks artificial, but it's not. What about Casey's claims regarding Egypt? Haven't recent discoveries in Gobekli Tepe in Turkey indicated that there was an advanced civilization around 10,000 BC? We'll be talking about Gobekli Tepe and similar structures in future episodes. Uh, While Gobekli Tepe doesn't date to 10,000 BC, it is almost that old. And it is the product of a more advanced civilization than what we'd previously been aware of. Uh, For those who may not have heard of it, Gobekli Tepe is an ancient ritual site that was made in the Neolithic period in Turkey. Um, Neolithic period means New Stone Age, um, and that took place after the end of the last Ice Age. Gobekli Tepe was produced by a Stone Age culture, so it wasn't a technologically advanced one. What makes it more advanced than expected is the amount of societal organization and craftsmanship required to build the site. Archaeologists weren't previously aware that people had that kind of organization and skilled labor available so soon after the Ice Age. Uh, But the site was still made using Stone Age tools, uh, not even tools made of metal. And we know that because we found the tools that they used to make the site. Um, It definitely wasn't made by a technologically advanced civilization that had electrical knives and death rays like Casey said Atlantis had. And also it's in Turkey, not Egypt. But if there was an advanced Stone Age society in Turkey, couldn't there have been one in Egypt? 
one that built the pyramids and the Sphinx? It's possible that there could have been a Neolithic society in Egypt that was more organized than we're currently aware of. But if so, it didn't build the pyramids. Uh, as we discussed back in episode 100, where we provided mysterious updates on stories we'd covered, even fringe authors writing about the pyramids have had to reverse themselves in light of new evidence and conclude that the pyramids date from the 4th dynasty in the 2500s BC, uh, not the 10,000s BC. As to the Sphinx, we'll be covering it in the future, but suffice it to say, there's been a lot of looking for the Hall of Records under it, including using modern sensing means, and we haven't found it. Overall, Casey's portrait of ancient Egyptian history does not hold up. And that's something admitted by Casey scholar Stefan Schwartz. And there are two major areas where I think the Casey material just doesn't hold up. One is his Egyptian history, and the other is Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And I say that as one of the people who, who wrote the first articles in modern times about Atlantis, because I was part of the, what became known as the Marine Archaeological Research Society that was founded by Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken fame. And when her son, who was a pilot, was flying over Bimini, where Casey places Atlantis, and saw a building yeah. under the water. Yeah. And we then went out and found the building, and, and the media thought it was an Atlantean temple. It turns out it's a turtle pen. And then we found the Bimini Road. Mm -hmm. And Peter Tompkins, who wrote Secret Life of Plants and a lot of other things, uh, Peter and I got the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey laboratories to, we took them a part of the road and had them analyze it. It's yeah. normal beach rock. It, yeah. it just looks like it's paving, but mm -hmm. they're just, so. A red I, herring all the way. Red, yes. So the Atlantean Temple turned out to be a, pen for turtles, and the Bimini Road turned out to be fractured beach rock. And even a Casey supporter like Schwartz is very frank about the inaccuracy of his material on Atlantis and Egypt. So have been other Casey supporters, such as Egyptologist Mark Lehner. Uh, his interest in Egyptology was inspired by the Casey readings, and his first book was published by Casey's Association for Research and Enlightenment, but ultimately, he had to reject Casey's version of the history of Egypt. Interestingly, Casey himself put up some cautions about the reliability of some of this material. In one of his readings on Atlantis, he said, Atlantis as a continent is a legendary tale. Whether or not that which has been received through psychic sources has for its basis those few lines given by Plato depends upon the trends of individual minds. As to whether this information is true or not depends upon the credence individuals give to this class of information. So even Casey isn't saying this material is true. He says that it may have its basis in what Plato wrote as interpreted by the trends of individual minds. In other words, apparently he may be getting telepathic overlay from what other people believe about Atlantis, not what's actually true, at least. That's how you could read it in terms of in modern psychic term. Edgar Cayce is also famous for making predictions about the future. What can you tell us here? In his book, Edgar Cayce in Context, K. Paul Johnson summarizes, The readings contain prophecies, dated and undated, with varying degrees of specificity, covering a period from Cayce's lifetime through the year 2158. As a time traveler, Casey appears to have been more successful in describing the future than the past, with most of his impressive hits involving the latter half of the 20th century. On the other hand, his predictions of events within his own lifetime were particularly fallible. According to Casey, San Francisco was to have a bigger earthquake in 1936 than in 1906, though, although by January 1936, he was saying this would not occur. 1934 was foretold to bring a great series of earth changes. Quote, the earth will be broken up in many places, a change in the physical aspect of the west coast of America. Open waters will appear in the northern portions of Greenland. New lands will be seen off the Caribbean Sea and dry land will appear. South America shall be shaken from the uppermost portion to the end. End quote. 
Political predictions for the year 1934 were equally dramatic. There will be the reduction of one risen to power in Central Europe to naught. The young king's son will soon reign. In response to a question, this country was identified as Germany, and this would seem to imply an early end to the Nazi regime and a return to the monarchy. 1936 was prophesied to bring severe wars and earthquakes. This would be related to the birth of a divine messenger named John in late 1936, before whose appearance the sun would be darkened and the earth broken up. Casey's famous for having predicted major earth changes in the 20th century. These include lands sinking and rising, and they included a shift in the earth's poles, that is, its axis of rotation, not its magnetic pole, uh, between 1958 and 1998. The year 1998 was particularly important in his predictions. He indicated that ancient records proving his readings would be found by then. And he indicated that this was when the earth changes would really hit the fan, with the west coast of the United States being devastated, most of Japan sinking into the sea and the pole shift, and even the second coming of Christ, though the readings are ambiguous about whether Christ would return in bodily form or whether he would return in a spiritual way as a presence of love and enlightenment in people's hearts. In any event, Casey saw 1998 as the beginning of the new spiritual age of Aquarius. And the second coming clearly didn't happen in 1998, whether interpreted bodily or as the dawn of a new spiritual age. Nor did his predictions of major earth changes or the discovery of records proving his readings or other things. Uh, Casey did have a few predictive hits. Uh, for example, he predicted that there would be racial tensions in America during the 20th century. And that happened, particularly between the 1950s and the 1970s with the civil rights movement and periodically since then. But you don't really need to be psychic to predict that kind of general societal trend. And when you look at his specific predictions, they regularly failed and had a low record of success. What about his past life readings where he claimed to tell people who they had been in previous incarnations? These are harder to evaluate because there were very few efforts to verify them against the historical record. Most of his clients apparently took Casey at his word and didn't do detailed investigations to see if the people they were said to be had actually existed. And in a lot of cases, there would be no way to verify this because Casey often told people that they lived in Atlantis or in his pre-dynastic version of Egypt, for which we have no records. It's also been noted that his past life readings have statistically unlikely patterns in them. This happens in a lot of reincarnation reports, particularly here in the West. Instead of reporting past lives that are consistent with the way most people actually lived in history, in extreme poverty as subsistence farmers, peasants, and slaves, far too many people claim to have been members of the upper class. They report being kings and princes and princesses and noblemen and priests. Similar improbability patterns turn up in the Casey readings. Uh, not only do a surprising number of the readings claim people were members of the upper class, they also assign them implausibly prominent roles in history. For example, Casey's life readings on himself and his family indicated that Edgar Casey himself was the Egyptian priest Ra Ta who designed the Great Pyramid. His son was a king in pre-dynastic Egypt, and Casey and his wife were the historical basis for the Egyptian gods Ra and Isis. Also, lots of his clients were told that they were characters in the Gospels or that they were otherwise witnesses of the life of Christ. And he even told two different clients that they were the same biblical character. All of that makes Casey's life readings very suspect from an evidential point of view. And in the current scholarly literature on reincarnation, one does not regularly find Casey's life readings presented as strong evidence. In fact, he's criticized by supporters of reincarnation like James G. Matlock. In his book, Signs of Reincarnation, Matlock writes, The most pervasive distortions of past life data occur when psychic practitioners are influenced by preconceptions about the reincarnation process. 
There is no better example than Edgar Cayce, whose life readings were strongly colored by theosophical notions introduced to him by Arthur Lammers. Perhaps because of the conceptual overlay, Casey's life readings were considerably less successful than his health readings. Much that Casey said, especially about earlier lives, either cannot be substantiated or is unlikely to have occurred as he depicted. So I don't think his past life readings are particularly worthy of note, evidentially speaking. What standards should we use when evaluating Casey? If he was an authentic psychic, should we expect all of his readings to be 100% accurate? No. As we've covered in previous episodes, psychic abilities are thought to be weak, natural abilities that are far from 100% reliable. In that regard, they're rather like our sense of smell compared to a dog's. Uh, we humans do have a sense of smell, but it's nowhere as precise or reliable as a bloodhound's. And responsible psychics don't claim 100% accuracy. In fact, Casey himself acknowledged uh, while he was still giving readings, that the readings should not be regarded as infallible. So the question of whether Casey had psychic abilities is not settled by the question of whether he was 100% accurate. Uh, he wasn't, but no human perceptions, even through the five conventional senses, are 100% accurate. And we wouldn't expect that level of accuracy from weaker means like psychic functioning is held to be. Sometimes, Casey supporters argue that he was an uneducated man who could not have come up with the information he did by conventional means. What do you make of this claim? It's true that he didn't have a formal education, but he did hang out with and talk to people who knew about the subject matter he was discussing in the readings. For example, he talked with alternative medical practitioners from whom he could have gained knowledge he used in the health readings. And he talked with theosophists and others interested in esoteric thought, which would have given him knowledge that could later appear in the life readings. In Edgar Casey in Context, K. Paul Johnson discusses an interview he conducted with Edgar Casey's grandson, a child psychologist named Charles Thomas Casey. He writes, Dr. Casey said that his grandfather had read little other than the Bible, but did engage in lengthy correspondence and conversations that might account or his exposure to various themes in his readings philosophy. Regardless of whatever modifications of one's estimation of the readings might result from research along these lines, however, he concluded that the medical readings remain the strongest evidence for the genuineness of Edgar Cayce's paranormal faculties. And that's consistent with what we've seen here. The health readings look like they have more credibility than the others, in which Edgar Casey often failed spectacularly from the reason perspective. Why would he be successful in one area, but so unsuccessful in others? One possibility is that he just had a psychic knack in one area, but not in others, uh, that the skills, his skills were more limited than realized. Another possibility is that he was the subject of telepathic overlay, as it's called in the remote viewing community. Just as we've discussed in episodes on remote viewing, a viewer might be able to pick up impressions on real-world targets, but what's he supposed to do if he's assigned a target that doesn't exist or that people have strong opinions about? In that case, his subconscious might rope around and find out what people believe about the target rather than get to what's actually true about the target. And those telepathic impressions might overlay the results he gets, introducing error. At least that's the theory that's been proposed, and it's what Stefan Schwartz thinks was happening with Edgar Casey. Here, he describes what he concluded after realizing Casey was so wrong on Atlantis and Egypt. And so I thought, well, why is he wrong about these two areas? And then I went back into the, because of the careful documentation, I went back into who had actually asked these questions. And these were people who were passionately committed. They had what you would call a cherished outcome. Yes, they had a cherished outcome and they had, they were true believers. Uh -huh. And I realized at that point and have now demonstrated this experimentally that in the non-local domain, a thing which is deeply believed by people is, in fact, as real as an actual thing. Mm -hmm. That that that's where archetype, the archetypal idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we know from, for instance, in remote viewing research, that 
if I were to give you uh, uh, an experiment in which one of the figures was your grandmother, that even though you don't know what the target, you know, it's in a sealed thing or it hasn't even been selected yet, but your grandmother's part of the target set, that there is a significant uh, probability that you will displace and describe uh, your grandmother. You'll I'll, be drawn to I'll that I'll be drawn target. to it, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. because things which are strongly held and believed have a reality mm -hmm. in, in the non-local domain that um, is actually equivalent to the mm -hmm. actual information. Yeah. And that would be consistent with the shift that occurred in Casey's readings after he met Arthur Lammers, as we talked about last episode. Prior to that time, he'd been giving health readings, but Lammers was a hardcore believer in astrology, reincarnation, and theosophical ideas. And lo and behold, as soon as he starts giving readings for Lammers, all this stuff starts popping out in the readings. He then went on to give similar readings for other people, and the same stuff kept coming out. In fact, Casey himself wondered if this material was really coming from Lammers. As we heard last episode, Edgar asked, What interests me is this. You say that I agree with all this stuff in my reading. Does that imply that my subconscious mind understands it? Or was I just being a stooge for your suggestions? So Casey himself thought that he might be getting this material for, from Lammers without consciously realizing it. Of course, you don't have to explain that in terms of telepathic overlay. You could say that Casey knew by entirely natural means that Lammers wanted to hear this stuff. After all, he had told Edgar the basic subjects of the readings he wanted to do. So maybe Casey just told him what he wanted to hear. And when someone asked Casey to do a life reading... He knew they wanted to hear about past lives, so he could have just made that material up. He could have, and this brings us back to the question of Casey's honesty, whether he was sincere, trying to help people with psychic readings, or whether he was a conscious fraud. As we heard earlier, uh, the people who actually knew Casey were convinced of his sincerity, and his family members down to today have maintained that he was sincere, as have others. One of the arguments that's sometimes mentioned in this connection is that he didn't get rich from the readings he did for people, and he lived very modestly. What do you make of that argument? I think it has some weight, but only some. Uh, Casey could have tried to become a celebrity psychic like Yuri Geller or Jay-Z Knight later did and charge his clients enough money to get rich, and he didn't do that. On the other hand, that's not conclusive proof of his sincerity, since people can refuse to get rich for a variety of reasons. He may have simply been shy enough that he didn't want the demands of being a self-promoting psychic celebrity and have to be on all the time. Or he may have just had modest ambitions, and once he had a way to live and feed his family, he didn't have the drive to go beyond that. If you were to make an argument that he was insincere, that he was a deliberate hoaxer, what would you point to? The thing that I find myself snagging on is the fact that Casey claimed not to remember what was said during his hypnotic sessions, um, that he had to be told what he'd said after the fact that would you know, indicate that he had post-hypnotic amnesia. As long-time listeners will know, I'm a skeptic of many of the claims made about hypnosis, which we discussed back in episode 52. There's a debate about the nature of hypnosis, and I favor the side of the debate that says hypnosis is essentially a learned social role. That is, it doesn't involve a dramatic change in the state of a person's consciousness, like sleep or intoxication with drugs or alcohol does. Instead, people know how a hypnotized person is supposed to act. They're supposed to relax, act sleepy, and comply with the directions they're given. And so that's what they do. Um, I mean, that's what they know they're supposed to do. And so when someone gets hypnotized, that's what they do. But people can't give themselves complete amnesia on command. So if that's what hypnosis is, we wouldn't expect a complete hypnotic amnesia to be possible. So I wouldn't expect Edgar Casey to really forget everything he said in his readings. Uh, I'm sure he would remember, I'm sure he wouldn't remember every word because people often don't remember every word they've just said. 
but they do remember the gist. And the fact that Casey said he didn't remember the gist makes me wonder about his sincerity. That presupposes your view of hypnosis, though. Correct. So if you have a different view of hypnosis, this argument will not apply. Also, uh, people seem to think that I have a particularly good memory, so it's possible that I have a harder time believing that someone could completely forget things under hypnosis. In other words, I may be biased on the issue. Uh, but I continue to look into hypnosis and whether complete post-hypnotic amnesia is a real thing, at least for some individuals. Now, what can we say about Edgar Casey from the perspective of Christian faith? We've discussed the faith implications of what it would mean if psychic functioning exists in previous episodes, so we don't need to be detained by that here. Uh, in particular, people may wish to go back and listen to episode 79 on religion, magic, psychic phenomena, and science, and episodes 102 and 103 on remote viewing, and episodes 105 and 106 on St. Thomas Aquinas and the occult. But there is one very big thing that we need to see about, say about Casey from the faith perspective, and I've been holding it back until now because I didn't want to prejudice listeners against Casey. I wanted them to have the chance to hear the evidence regarding his psychic functioning in general before we get to the faith perspective. What is it that listeners need to be aware of? Even though Casey started as a devout Christian, he ended up embracing a worldview that is at odds with the Christian faith. Not only did he end up adopting belief in reincarnation, he also ended up advocating ideas about the origin and destiny of the human soul that aren't compatible with Christian teaching. In essence, Casey adopted a pantheistic, neoplatonic worldview in which our souls were originally part of God, but they separated, misused free will, fell into sin, and became corrupted. And the goal of reincarnation is to repair this corruption over the course of multiple lifetimes. Once a soul has reached perfection, it is said to have achieved Christ consciousness, at which point it can return and realize its oneness with God again. What implications does that have from a Christian point of view? It distorts the relationship between creator and creature. On this view, we are not created beings, but parts of God that became detached and that one day will be reabsorbed into God. Not only does this produce a non-Christian view of man, it also produces a non-Christian view of God, because on this view, God is not perfect, timeless, indivisible being, but a being that changes over time, loses parts of himself, and then regains them again. What about the Christ consciousness that Casey refers to? Does that have implications regarding the person of Jesus Christ? It does, because on Casey's view, Christ was not the unique Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. Instead, Jesus was just the first human being to attain Christ consciousness. According to Casey's readings, Jesus was just like the rest of us, a finite soul that separated from God, misused free will, and became corrupt. He then experienced a bunch of lifetimes in which he gradually worked his way back to perfection. In fact, according to Casey, Jesus originally incarnated on earth as Adam, the first man, and he worked his way back up the spiritual ladder until he achieved Christ consciousness in his incarnation as Jesus of Nazareth. This completely undoes the doctrine of the Trinity, which is the central teaching of the Christian faith, and it guts the Christian doctrine of redemption, because Jesus didn't save us from our sins by dying for us on the cross. Instead, on Casey's view, he simply showed us the way back to God by attaining Christ consciousness. And the way we get back to God is through our own efforts as spirituality. Um, and our destiny is not to be resurrected and live with God and Christ in the eternal order it's to be reincarnated until we're perfect and can be literally reabsorbed by God. So this takes a radically different vision of God and man and is not compatible with the Christian faith. It also takes non-Christian concepts and redresses them in Christian terms, but it's fundamentally different in substance. One of the things we looked at in episode 188 on when demons are involved and when they aren't is that demons want to deceive people by getting them to adopt false beliefs about God. Could Edgar Cayce's psychic readings have been produced by demons? 
I can't rule this out as a possibility, though I don't see strong a strong evidential case for it. In his activities, Casey was not invoking spirits and was not trying to channel spirits. And that's one of the key things that tends to be an indicator of possible demonic involvement. Since if you're summoning spirits, you don't know which ones will respond and show up. And even if spirits do show up, though, they can't just be assumed to be demons. However, Casey wasn't trying to summon spirits, although he did apparently speak with them on occasion. And so, you know, there could be some involvement there. We also don't need to look further than Arthur Lammers and, you know, other people that Casey was in contact with for the origin of his theosophical ideas and similar subjects in order to explain the material that he came up with in the readings. Whether that material was the product of telepathic overlay or whether he subconsciously or semi-consciously just wanted to please his clients or whether he was a conscious fraud bent on telling his clients what they wanted to hear, you don't need demons to explain why he repeated back so many esoteric theosophical ideas to his clients. And so, while anything is possible, I don't see a strong evidential basis for the demon hypothesis here. But I don't dismiss it either. All right, Jimmy, so what's your bottom line on Edgar Cayce? Edgar Cayce is an interesting individual with an interesting life story. By all accounts, he was a sincere man and one who struggled uh, with the information coming back in his readings. When we look at the readings that he did, like other psychics, he didn't have a 100% success rate, but he didn't claim to. Considering the readings by category, there is evidence that would support the proposal that he had actual remote viewing ability, as well as a knack for medical diagnosis and treatment recommendations. However, his readings on other subjects like Atlantis, Egypt, past lives, and future predictions are demonstrably unreliable and should not be credited. Jimmy, what further resources can we offer? We'll have a link to Thomas Segrew's book, There is a River, also K. Paul Johnson's book, Edgar Casey in Context, and Edgar Evans Casey and Hugh Lynn's Casey's book, The Outer Limits of Edgar Casey's Power, as well as the Pit card game that we talked about last episode that Casey designed, uh, information about Casey from the Sci Encyclopedia and Wikipedia, also a recording, a voice recording of Casey giving a reading. Uh, we'll have a couple of those so you can hear his voice. We'll have information about the Pit game, as well as information about Atlantic University, the Stephen Schwartz interview on Jeffrey Mishlove's New Thinking Aloud program, also information on Gnosticism, more information about the Italian reading, as well as information about Bimini Road, Gobekli Tepe, and an evaluation of Casey's life readings by J. Gordon Melton, and information about post-hypnotic amnesia. Very good. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this time? Well, back in episode 73, we told you about Somerton Man, a mysterious man who died on Somerton Beach in Australia uh, back in the 1940s, and he had cut all the labels out of his clothing, and there was speculation he was a spy. And since we did that episode, there have been, um, he, his body was exhumed, exhumed to get DNA evidence, and now we have a name. Um, but it didn't come from the DNA evidence from the exhumation. Instead, it came from hairs that were um, from the hair follicles that were uh, in a death mask that they made. So they put plaster of Paris on his head to make a death mask. It took some hairs with it, and they were able to get the DNA from the hairs. And Somerton Man's name apparently was Carl Webb, but he went by the name Charles Webb. He was an Australian. He was born in 1905, and we know at least a little bit at this point about his life story, including the fact that he had a brother-in-law named Thomas Keene, and the name T. Keene was found in some of the clothing that Somerton Man had in his luggage. So that's extra confirmation. It looks like Carl Charles Webb was Somerton Man. Um, we'll have links to an article announcing this in Forensic Magazine, as well as a, an article uh, by CNN. One of the questions about Somerton Man was whether or not he was a spy. 
and exactly why he died. Was he, for example, poisoned? Um, you can go back and, and listen to episode 73 for the evidence regarding that. But as far as I'm aware, despite the discovery of his apparent identity, which the Australian police have yet to confirm based on the exhumation DNA, um, but based on the, the discovery of his identity, it does not appear to me that those questions are settled. Uh, there's still, he could still be a spy. He could still have been involved in something nefarious that led to his death. So all that's still on the table as far as I know, although there are also other possibilities. Very good. Well, nice to see mysteries get some explanation, of, yeah. uh, if not a complete one. So that's it from us this time. What are your theories about Edgar Casey, his psychic readings, and what they had to say? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world uh, in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for all the video and animation work they did on this episode. You can check out their work by going to youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. They do the video production for every episode of the show. Um, and uh, while you're there, I'd really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get a notice whenever I have a new video, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. I'm trying to uh, to grow the channel currently would like to get up to 50,000. And the only way that happens is when people um, subscribe to the show. So I'd really appreciate it if you did. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next week is a fifth Friday. So we will be doing fifth Friday weird questions and it will be very interesting. As it always is. Folks, be sure to follow Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or, again, at, at YouTube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, where you make sure to hit that bell to get notifications. You'll find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the Mysterious headlines on our show notes at Mysterious.fm slash 225. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V dot com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.